Welcome to the Deep Impact Investing Podcast with Kimberly Griego-Kyle of Horizon Sustainable Financial Services. In this podcast, we discuss sustainable impact investing, creating portfolios that match your values, and a variety of other topics such as financial education, social justice, and sustainable food systems. Do you want to know if your investments seek the kind of accountability from corporations that you demand? Listen in as we explore the burning question, are you investing like you give a damn? Hello and welcome to Deep Impact Investing with Kimberly Greg O'Kyle from Horizon Sustainable Financial Services. Kim, how are you? I'm doing good, Eric. And you? I'm doing fantastic. I so excited to get back together with you. We had a little bit of a break there and uh, we're back at it. And you have brought another amazing topic to the podcast today. I I think I have. I, I really kind of racked my brain and looked at a lot of different ideas for this particular podcast because it's number 75. Yeah, that's right. Congratulations. I, number yeah. 75, another milestone. <laughs> it's crazy. I'm happy. So what I really wanted to do was discuss something that was very, um, very important, something that impacts all of us and, um, and something that we really need to pay attention to. And that is, <laughs> and it is, so I, don't we have a are, drum roll. <laughs> I know. Da, 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 da. So th- today's topic is about water mm. and the emergency situation that we're in. Yeah. And, and, yeah, I mean, people go, oh, yeah, there's, you know, definitely problems, right? I I really, before I get into it, I want to, I want to remind uh, previous listeners or and let new listeners know that I have this sort of mantra that I generally use whenever we talk about these serious subjects mm-hmm. um, in, you know, in the podcast. And my process is generally to tell you the difficult or horrible thing, right? And then give mm-hmm. you some uh, great ways to mitigate the problem or find solutions or things that we can do. And I have to tell you, even um, the solutions are a little bit grim for this problem. Yeah. So, I, I, you know, <laughs> I don't want to scare people off in the first couple of minutes, but I think it's still very, very important to gain this knowledge, to understand what's happening, because in this case, ignorance is really not bliss. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to talk about water. Um, Water has become a national crisis Mm -hmm. for us. Uh, We either have way too little, some places have too much, and there is what we're calling or has been called a mega drought in the Southwest yeah. of the U S. So I, you know, I, I'm in New Mexico, right. And we'll talk about the drought here, but we also have this um, saying here in New Mexico, el agua es su vida. And for those of you who don't speak Spanish, <laughs> it means water is your life. Mm-hmm. It is life for everyone, right? We've we've heard that before. Um, and right now, water is also a messenger for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's literally not just knocking on the door, but maybe even pounding on the door of 100 plus million people in this country and starting to really loudly deliver bad news. Uh, about the effects of climate change. This is where we're really seeing it. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I mean, again, I think it's all around us. Unless we're experiencing it firsthand, it's too easy to say, oh, that's that's terrible, right? Oh, that's terrible. That's terrible that it's happening. I remember hearing about Flint, right? Flint, Michigan. Right. And going, man, that is terrible. As I can pot, you know, as I can absolutely walk to my tap and, and pull water out of my tap and drink it on the spot without any concerns. I mean, sure, there may be a few things in there, but it's still, it's not making me sick and it's not brown coming out of my tap. Right. And you know, what's interesting too, on top of um, some of the headlines I'm going to share with you, um, one of them it, you know, is uh, Jackson, Mississippi. We're all hearing about that. Correct. Yeah, just they, recently. Absolutely. Yeah. Just in the last several days. And so they, they literally 
have no water. Their, their, their systems are completely down. And <laughs> I don't know how that happens. I, that's complete neglect, honestly. Um, you know, there's been a lot of really interesting headlines in the last month or so. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the Guardian had an article, America's Water Crisis. Um, the Texas Tribune, uh, August 16th, so, you know, a few weeks ago, uh, South Texas running out of water due to drought. Um, and then uh, National Geographic, just a few days before that, August 11th, why is America running out of water? <laughs> mm-hmm. It just goes on and on. And, you know, um, it, Las Vegas, Nevada, uh, Lake Mead water shortage. Yep. I think we've been hearing about that. And and CNN on August 21st, the Southwest's looming water battle. So we're not just talking about a crisis, but the battle <laughs> around around water. And we're going to talk about some of that because you know, really this list could go on and on and on. Yeah. Um, I want to begin with an understanding uh, that I'm I'm not going to sugarcoat this. Uh, you know, it's a shit show. <laughs> I'll be honest. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to put it out there. Uh, I'm not saying that we're quite to the Mad Max scenario yet. Um, I, I, I don't know if you've seen Mad Max. I think a lot of people have, oh, yeah. but That's yeah, great, <laughs> so it great is a good... movie and fiction right now. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, we've always thought of it as fiction, but honestly, uh, you know, I, I do see that that could be, could be not will be, um, a, a possibility over the next three to five generations. Literally we're talking about the next hundred years. Mm -hmm. of this planet. And I know we've all heard it before, but it's been said many times, there will be wars over water. Yeah. So it's a, it's an interesting situation. And, you know, (laughs) I was thinking about the article, um, you know, the Southwest looming water battle, right? Uh, There's already fights happening in the U S over water. Um, We've seen it in New Mexico, um, Texas owns a lot of the water rights of the Rio Grande. And so they're able to siphon off a lot of the water that we really need here in New Mexico. Florida and Georgia have fought over water. I don't have details on that, but also Tennessee, there's been fights over water. One thing I didn't realize, Eric, is um, about a century ago in California, um, Arizona, uh, area uh, along the Colorado River. Each side, the California side, the Arizona side, they had armed state guard troops opposite each other, fighting over really? water. A century ago, <laughs> yeah, Jeez. yeah. And uh, I don't think I ever read that in a textbook. Uh, some of this, of course, raises the question. Um, how can we be short on water in the United States when, when there's also so much flooding happening? I know mm-hmm. you're asking me that, so I'm going to tell you the answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it is it is odd, right? I mean, it, to to hear that, right? But I know there's reasons. There are, and you know, in New Mexico, we have uh, annual monsoons, or we're supposed to. Mm-hmm. Um, over the 24 years I've lived here, I've seen it shift. We've had years like last year where there was almost no monsoon rains. And this year where we've had really good monsoon rains for a change, because uh, we are in this mega drought, um, you know, but due to the increased rains that have been happening and also water runoff from a burn scar from the largest wildfire we have ever had in the state. Um, that is literally up in the Santa Fe National Forest. And so we've seen a lot of flooding here because of those particular things. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I know people have heard me talk about, you know, listeners have heard me talk about my rural property. And due to this mega drought, we we recently had to remove about 50, trees, um, which, you know, doesn't sound like a lot, but it, here in New Mexico, where there's not a lot of tree growth, yeah, that, yeah, it's significant. And, you know, I thought we were doing well. 
um, after having those done, but I literally have been watching out my kitchen window for the last two weeks, another beautiful pinion tree dying. Mm. And you can just see it getting worse day by day. And the, the reason that's happening here is due to a bark beetle infestation. This happens when we get into a serious drought situation. So hmm. I imagine if I really walked my property, I'd probably find another two dozen trees that have to come down. Um, but oh. the, you know, it's, it's frightening. It's scary. And I know how you love statistics. So I gathered some for you. All right. <laughs> yeah. It's looking up already. <laughs> it is. <laughs> yeah. I don't think these statistics, mean, statistics, the statistics are going to be any, are going to make me any happier though. I don't no, think these are good, probably, good statistics. <laughs> Probably not. Um, so let's talk about some of these things. You know, I, I think a lot of people have, if they're paying attention, they've heard about Lake Mead mm -hmm. and the low water situation there. Uh, in Lake Mead, if if you don't know, is our nation's largest fresh water reservoir. Yeah, and and I guess I didn't really realize that that was the case, but. It's, it's literally dropped to 25%, maybe 22% of where it should be mm -hmm. of capacity. And they don't have, but a few more months worth of water in, in Lake Mead before they won't be able to, to draw water off of it. Um, you know, Lake Powell's in a similar situation. That's, uh, I, I remember, gosh, it was 22 years ago. We spent a couple of weeks during the summer at Lake Powell. I probably wouldn't even recognize it. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, you know, the problem's not just about water usage downstream, uh, which goes to crops and, um, you know, really sustaining life in mm -hmm. the Southwest. <laughs> but it's it's also a problem because when Lake Mead has no water or not enough water, Hoover Dam does not operate. Yeah. And Hoover Dam is a major source of electricity in the Southwest area of this country. Mm -hmm. And, and this will lead us to power grid instability and really severe vulnerability in our, in our power systems in this area of the country. So that's concerning. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I, uh, I don't think that, uh, I'm, well, I'm pretty sure that neither Lake Mead or Lake Powell do anything for Texas. I think it's all for Arizona, California, the, the, the states that are surrounding that area, obviously. But this is not new, Kim. I mean, you, you know that. Right? And this is what you're talking about. I remember um, we were looking on uh, Zillow. It was actually Zillow. I'll be honest. We were looking for <laughs> properties just for fun. And I, yeah. I was looking at different things. And we've always kind of wanted to, to move to Texas. That's where my wife's family's from. So we had looked around and I told my wife, I said, look, Candy, if, if we're going to move there, I've got to be near water because I've been away from water for so long. And I found a property on a lake. And this was probably a good seven to 10 years ago on a lake, beautiful acreage. It had zebras on the property. Oh my and gosh. It, oh, and it had like nine buildings way out of my price range. Not a chance. It was a huge <laughs> ranch, right? Um, I can't remember how many acres, but it was huge and it was on this lake, but, and, and the price was slashed and the price was slashed and it hadn't sold in a long time. And I was looking at it. Then I did a little more research. The lake was being drained. Uh... The entire, the, the, I mean, you could still go down to the boat, but it was probably another extra, you know, 40 feet of shoreline that were, was there that wasn't there before because- mm. The, 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 the lake was continually being drained for the use of water, which is fine. People need the water, but that was a reservoir. And now it's even worse at that lake. I can't remember what that lake's name is, but I know that Texas is doing that. They're draining more and more lakes because they can't keep up with demand. And right. so it's not just, you know, Lake Mead, Lake Powell. These are huge issues for every state that uses reservoir or uses reservoirs for electricity. Right. Uh, right. I, yeah. And and we're also doing that to our major rivers in this country. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think a lot about the Southwest because I've lived here for a while, but um, the, the Colorado River Basin is incredibly important to this area of the country and for food production uh, in California and Arizona. 
it's, it's interesting. Um, water goes to seven different States from the Colorado river and you're, mm-hmm. and, uh, yeah. So by the time you get really far downstream, there's almost nothing left. And, you know, there's, um, uh, uh, there was a request requirement, you should say, demand maybe, uh, from the U.S. government for these seven states to cut water usage from the Colorado River by forty percent. Mm. They had a deadline, and and they they missed that deadline. So so now the the government is going to do it for them. Tell them what they have to be doing. Tell them what the farmers in this area have to be doing, and and you know what's necessary in order to save the Colorado River. Um, if you if you came to Albuquerque, Santa Fe, and decided I'm going to go see the Rio Grande, I mean you know it's supposed to be the big river, right? Yeah, it's literally a muddy trickle. Mm. It's. <laughs> It's really depressing. Um, I just can't say it enough. Uh, this is a national emergency. We are running out of time. Um, you know, we have to think about what happens when also these downstream users um, who who have to cut this, um, you know, two to four million acre feet of water, uh, which is re- that's what's being required. That's a lot. We're talking million. Yeah. Um, you know, it, the, in, back in 2018, Arizona had to cut 20% of their water usage from the river. So this was five years ago, uh, four years ago. Sorry. <laughs> can't do math today. <laughs> I can't but, say the word statistics. So either way. Right. <laughs> right. So we're good. Um, y- you know, it's what happened is the farmers in Arizona really had, I was just going to say, they had a tizzy about it. And, you know, so um, Arizona said, all right, fine, go ahead and pull from the groundwater. Hmm. Well, here we go again, thinking, well, this sounds maybe like a good idea. But what has happened is a rapid acceleration of groundwater depletion. When I think of that, I think, huh, my well could run dry if we don't keep our water table supported. Um, it's, it's a very interesting situation there. Here's another real, this is to me is really interesting and something I would have never thought of, but when we're de when we are depleting groundwater, what happens is the earth starts to sink and we think, what do you mean it starts to sink? <laughs> but literally, um, measurements in parts of the Central Valley of California, um, they've taken measurements in those areas. And there are places that are 28 feet lower mm-hmm. than they were a century ago. Yeah. And, and <laughs> people think, well, wait, if the water's there, it that's not a solid surface. So why right. wouldn't it have sunk before? But here's the thing is that when you have water there, there's pressure. Yep. There's still pressure pushing out on all those areas. So it, it maintains itself when you just have an empty chasm. Yeah. When you drain that aquifer. Yeah. I mean, there's that's, nothing to support the earth above. Absolutely. Yeah. It's so crazy and interesting and scary all at the same time. Um, you know, Farming in California and Arizona uh, use about 80% of their available water. That's a lot. And, you know, unfortunately, California mainly and somewhat Arizona provide crops and produce for most of this country. You know, you can be in a grocery store back east in Philadelphia and find your California strawberries or whatever mm-hmm. it happens to be. Um, you know, farmers are planting these, you know, we consider them high water use crops. Um, you know, but these crops don't particularly feed the entire United States. And it might be strawberries or, you know, other things along those lines, which we don't want to get rid of strawberries, but we may have to. Um, you know, it's we have to look at crops that are more water efficient. Uh, 
mm-hmm. um, in our food system. Um, crops that are more drought tolerant. And interestingly, I was reading crops that are saline water tolerant. Oh. And, you know, you think, well, I can't water my crops with salt water. Uh, I would imagine we would be desalinating it a bit, but Mm -hmm. maybe not to the point of drinking water. So we have to look at that as a, as an issue. Hmm. Uh, Eric, do you see where I'm going with this? Like this, we're talking about a climate, water and food nexus that we're faced with. Um, these are all, all three of these issues are intertwined in, in my opinion, um, all are also of equal importance and really in the same state of crisis. I talk a lot about food systems because it's a passion of mine. We will not have much of a food system if we don't have water. We are having water issues because of climate change. It's all connected. Yeah. 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 <sighs> oh, I know it's a lot. And I, I want to take a minute and recognize that, um, you know, the United States is not the first to experience water crisis. You know, we, <laughs> you know, it's, a uh, it's interesting because, um, I was reading some articles on earth.org. And if you really want to feel the depth of this global issue, spend some time on that website and, uh, you know, and, and read many of these articles, you know, they have a August, 2022 article that talks about the many countries that are, um, you know, experiencing water crisis and water scarcity right now. Uh, there's a organization called, um, you know, how I like to find these interesting organizations. This is the world resources Institute, and they have a ranking system for um, water stress uh, the, and it's a five category ranking system. So the worst being extremely high water stress. And uh, you know, when, when they talk about water stress, they're talking about um, the stress on the area, the stress on the resources, you know, all of those things mm-hmm. that can happen. And there's 17 countries currently in that category. You might think, well, that doesn't sound like a lot, but uh, 12 of those 17 are located in Northern Africa Mm -hmm. and the Middle East. I I don't think this necessarily surprises anyone. Yeah, no, (laughs) that's pretty dry (laughs) areas in my opinion. Right? Um, You know, they've had problems for probably the last century. And so we're like, okay, but um, that's the problem. They've been having these issues with water scarcity and, and water supplies for probably close to a hundred years and we've been ignoring it, not just the U S but globally, we're really not paying attention to this problem. Well, I, I, you know, that maybe this is too tongue in cheek. I don't know. I was thinking about, you know, okay, we didn't actually a hundred percent ignore it when it was happening. Um, I don't know if you remember back in the eighties, there was this unprecedented recording of feed the world. Do you remember the song? Oh yeah. So 40 years ago we saw this coming and we had to gather all of these famous singers and musicians and and they had to sing about food and water crisis uh, in Africa. So we, we've known it was there. Um, but, you know, we just thought it was a fun song rather than really looking at the potential we had then for some serious conservation effort, efforts. Well, here's the thing. And I'm not playing devil's advocate by any means here, but, you know, I'm 48 years old. and. Yeah it's been like that ever since I was a kid. Yep. It was to me, I always thought, well, why do people live there? Right. I mean, why, why would you want to live in a desert area in an arid place where you have to, you don't have water readily available to you. I remember, you know, seeing all the videos and things of Ethiopia when I was a kid, food shortages and the children. I thought that is terrible. Why do they live there? Right. But, Where are they going to go? Exactly. So there, there's a the, the great question, but it, then it, you have to go back and think, 
has it always been that way? But like you said, for the last hundred years, they've been dealing with this, but what did it look like 200 years ago, 300 years ago? I don't know. I wasn't there. I have no idea. And then, right. so it makes me think, what is it going to look like in the, the Southwest region in the United States in a hundred years in 150 years, somebody who's 48 years old is going to say, has it not always been that way? Right. Right. I mean, right. because that's what I'm used to. And so I didn't know that there was no intervention and, and I don't think we had the technology 200 years ago to help them out at all, but no. we do now. We absolutely do now. Um, and we also have resources and technology to help ourselves. Absolutely. Now, uh, and, and more and more is being developed all the time. Um, it, you know, <laughs> there's a great article in uh, ProPublica, uh, which is um, a site website for investigative journalism uh, by a guy named Abram Lustgarten. I'm assuming it's German. Sounds <laughs> like it. it that way. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he's interviewing uh, another gentleman whose name is Jay. Oh, I'm going to get this wrong. Jay Fem Femmigetti. Femmigetti. I think that's it. Femmigetti. It's Italian, probably. Yeah. And and Jay. We're just going to call him Jay. <laughs> he's the executive better, yeah. director of the Global Institute for Water Security. Uh, Jay does not shy away from this topic uh, of water scarcity. He mm -hmm. he really is um, a big advocate for for change and solutions. You know, he's he seems, you know, reading this article of this interview with him, like a really no-nonsense kind of guy. And, you know, he gets down to some really frightening details in the article. I, I also do encourage listeners to to find this article. Um, it it will leave you without any doubt that we're not doing enough fast enough. Mm -hmm. And you know, I really don't think I'm too far off in saying that this accelerating water crisis and water scarcity is also likely to be a political power disruptor, not just here, but globally. Mm -hmm. we've, we've seen it before. You know, we were just talking a minute ago about some places in Africa, Ethiopia, a lot of their food crisis uh, situations happened due to political instability. Yeah. So we, we, we're going to see more of that. So what do we do? Uh, do we cut back our personal usage? Um, do we recycle 100% of the rainwater we can catch for our gardens and even use in toilets, things like that. Should we get composting toilets that are what? not using any water? Wait, <laughs> have wait, you wait. heard of a composting toilet? I, I have not heard of a composting <laughs> toilet. I'm, not yeah. a little, I'm a little scared. What is a composting <laughs> toilet? <laughs> so, okay. So a composting toilet, uh, is something that you would normally see, you know, in cabins and places like that. Although people are putting them in their homes, oh, okay. they use no water. Um, I, my understanding is you have to add some chemical product, which, you know, may also not be great, but, uh, in order to break down the waste, hmm. uh, the one place that I have, or I've been to a, a couple of places where I've used a, a composting toilet, there's no odor. Interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, it's literally composting your human waste. Yeah. Not so you can put it in your garden by any means, but you know, it's, it's doing that. <laughs> it's, yeah. I think this, it's similar to having, uh, which, you know, they're illegal now in New Mexico, but having a leech field for your septic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So it's that kind of thing. So yeah. Do we do that? <laughs> well, I, you know, well, here, I, I like your other idea better, better than that, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I, I actually just watched a video about, um, a couple in Arizona. Cause I lived in Arizona for a while. That's where my wife and I met and the monsoons were just beautiful. I loved it. Yeah. I love rain, especially down there because it's warm rain. So it's almost, you know, like a spa treatment at, at a point, Right. <laughs> but this, this couple spent $12,000 and, and, basically just dug a hole. Now, obviously they, there's more in the hole than, than meets the eye, but they built a 9,000 gallon cistern that they wow. are, they now park on and it costs them $12,000. They catch 
a tremendous amount of the rain when it comes through because it doesn't come through often. But when it does, it, it's that monsoon that you're talking about. It comes down in buckets. And so right. they started collecting this. They use only that for any of their vegetables and, and any of the things that they're growing. That's all they use. And they Amazing. for their household, it's almost completely... The, their their bill is the lowest it can possibly be from the the utilities district because they use water for everything else from the cistern. They all you know that's not that much money. Twelve thousand no. dollars is not that much money to make that big of an impact for one family. In my in my opinion, right? It's and, probably a little more now, but yes, it's yeah. still reasonable and very effective. The thing honestly. that gets me is it's a, this is a normal couple that comes up with this and does this. Yeah. Where are our leaders that are supposed to be a lot smarter than us? <laughs> Make, you know, We've been to, asking that question know, for, right, for a very long time. Very yeah. Very long time. I was just reminded when you talked about that um, in California, if you live rurally, uh, I, it's a certain amount of anchorage that if you have this certain amount of anchorage, you have to have your own water tank in case there's a fire. Oh yeah. Hmm. And you know, when, when Rose moved here with me, um, she was like, wait a minute, we don't have to, we're not required to have our own water tank. Uh, you know, we live on a, a nice wooded piece of property mm -hmm. and the, <laughs> if, if a fire started here, it would literally spread so it's fast. Yeah. Yes. It's just tinder dry from the drought. And so that is actually a really good uh, solution if you are using um, catchment to fill mm -hmm. that tank. Mm -hmm. So there are ways to do that. I, I, I like it. I like it. I'm adding that to the list. <laughs> Things yeah. that we should do. You know, uh, we also have to think about, and I've talked about this many times, you know, eating more locally um, and, and, and eating less meat because mm -hmm. You know, if we just talk about cattle, um, they are going to eat alfalfa and corn. Um, many of our feed animals eat those two things. They are very high water use crops. So yes, I mean, all of these things and, and, and more, I, I think if we talked about it for a while, we could come up with a number of additional things, mm -hmm. uh, you know, personally, but we also need and this is where you know, we have to get our government active, right? Doing something, um, you know, and, and yes, I will give a positive nod to the recent climate change legislation that was passed. Uh, I don't think it's far enough uh, because we really are not looking as much at the water issues that as we should be. Mm -hmm. You know, what we really need is a much more progressive climate policy in this country and and frankly globally um one that looks at groundwater management also in addition to above water or above ground water yeah. management so you know those reservoirs the rivers those things all of this has to be combined we also need a national water policy we don't have one <laughs> you know, we have to have one that looks at this big at the big picture um what the what the big picture approach should be, um, how we're gonna solve these problems, you know, looking at water usage and and all of the resources across the different regions of this country. Because while the Southwest is in a drought, uh, many areas of the country are not. Um, doesn't mean they're not having water issues. We just you know talked about a couple of different ones: Flint, you know, Jackson, Mississippi. Those are not necessarily caused from um, over usage, uh, but they are caused by a lack of concern over local water systems. Additionally, we have to also look at, uh, or you know, we have to look at having the EPA recognize that when we have lower rainfall in areas, there's less dilution of groundwater contaminants. And, you know, groundwater gets contaminated very easily, mm -hmm. but when it drains into our aquifers, it gets filtered out. 
However, when we have lower rain quantities, those chemicals are in much higher quantities in that smaller amount of water. And, you know, then we have a, a terrible quality of, of groundwater that we desperately need access to. Yeah. Yeah. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, we have to recognize this is not just a U.S. problem. Um, it's not just an us problem. <laughs> it's an mm -hmm. everybody problem. Uh, so we have to, to look at all of those things. We are, we're in a danger zone. Um, I, and I, I don't say that lightly. Uh, if, um, I, I just want to say if every listener of this podcast shares this with 10 people and they share it with 10 people and on and on, we might see some meaningful change in our water systems and in how we use our water. Mm -hmm. And hope that that action, um, the action that I, I just, I want to visualize in my brain, um, will help us uh, enough to mitigate some of the problems that we're having. It's not going to hundred percent go away. It never will. Um, but I don't know about you, Eric, but I'm not quite ready for the uh, Mel Gibson, or if you like the newer version, the Charlie's Throne, <laughs> you know, uh, adventure of um, scouting for water and energy sources. So <laughs> I would totally, I would totally love to ride shotgun with her. She was amazing well, in that movie. However, yeah. not to look for water, not to, you know, no, I mean, yeah, no, that's a, that's a whole different issue. It but is. It, and here's the thing is it, it, I love that you said that at the, you know, near, near the close here with, you know, sharing it with 10 people and sharing it with 10 people and so on, because that creates a domino effect. Mm -hmm. And and that's the domino effect that we need because the domino effect that we're going to have is with the lack of water, we're going to have less crops. So we're going to have to deal with food issues yep. with less water. We're not going to have the, the energy production that we need. Therefore the energy production and electricity, when there's, when we have problems with that, people are going to shy away from electric vehicles. Well, I'm not going to be able to charge oh, my vehicle. I'm not going to be right. able to do this. So therefore, how are we going to create more power? To create more power, we're going to have to burn hmm. fuel of some kind, whether it's coal or whether it's whatever, yeah. right? Which again, the dominoes continue to fall. And so if if the fuel is being more we great burn energy, those, yeah, correct. the more we burn those types of fuel, the the worse Absolutely. all of these problems become. Right. And because then fuel shortages become a thing and then gas prices go higher because of the different types of fuels that are being used. It, it, it's a never ending cycle in a bad direction. So I would love for people to get on board with a domino effect in a positive way. Right. I, and I know this is called the deep investing podcast and, and there are ways to, to look at some of these water issues, uh, in investment wise, um, specifically the privatization of water, mm -hmm. that is a problem. Uh, you know, when, when certain organizations or companies are allowed to sell water, then it becomes, it can become a very high priced commodity. So addressing that now, before it does begin to be a phenomenal problem down the road is, is important. And, yeah. and we can do that in, in investment portfolios. And yep. I know, um, you know, people are thinking, well, how do you do that? Well, we, we, we don't have time to go into all of that, but <laughs> if, if listeners are interested in how that might work in their portfolio or looking at the issues of climate change and food resources, we at Horizon Sustainable Financial Services can help you with that. And you can reach either myself or Johan at the office at 505-982-9661 or email us at info at horizonssfs.com. Kim, thank you so much. I don't always enjoy the, <laughs> the brute force of the topic, but I always yeah. enjoy the conversation and education. So I, I, I thank too. you so much. I, I thank you too, Eric, for participating in these conversations with me, because honestly, when you just talked about the 
the rise in electricity prices and burning coal and not being able to have electric vehicles. I hadn't thought of that yet. So thank you. Sorry to add that to the top of that. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> it's good. Things on there. Yeah. yeah. It's just stuff we have to think about and we have to Absolutely. really take some action instead of just sitting here thinking. So yes. Kim, again, thank you so much for the content today. Thank you, Eric. You bet. And of course, our last thank you goes to you listening audience. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Deep Impact Investing Podcast with Kimberly Grigo Kyle. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Kim comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. And we humbly ask that you share this podcast, rate it and leave a review as this will help others find the show. And that's what we need in this situation. This type of show needs to be shared and other people need to be able to find it. Again, thank you so much for listening today. For everyone at Horizon Sustainable Financial Services, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to Deep Impact Investing, the sustainable, responsible impact investing podcast that shows you how to invest like you give a damn. If you have questions about this podcast or topics you'd like to hear addressed on an upcoming podcast, email us at kim at horizonssfs.com. Join the conversation on Twitter at Horizons S U S T F I N or give us a call at 505 982 9661. Don't forget to click the subscribe button to be notified when new episodes become available. The companies we may speak about during our podcast are not recommendations for investment. Only you and your financial advisor can determine what the right investments are for you. Horizon Sustainable Financial Services, Inc. and its financial professionals do not render tax or legal advice. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the host and or guest and does not necessarily represent the views and opinions of Horizon Sustainable Financial Services. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service providers with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. None of this content may be used or duplicated without the express written agreement of the podcast host.